Hello, I'm Dapper Dan Gavazdan, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which definitely count. And I'm mischievous Mark Giannacchio, and I too own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, but Dan, as I've been saying for many, many years now, the annuals don't count. Mark, for as much as you and I joke about our collections of Amazing Spider-Man, which really, the, the the big joke is it doesn't really give us many bona fides to, uh, to talk about Spider-Man. I mean, we've done the show long enough, I think, that it's given us some credentials. Um, but our collection is something we just like to kind of joke about, even though we are quietly, or maybe not so quietly, proud of it. I was contacted by someone recently who said, do you guys really own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man or do you own like <laughs> them in like trade paperbacks or like collections or reprints? And I wanted to kind of like say like, no, no, for the record, we own every original issue of Amazing Spider-Man in whatever way you count that collection as being annuals or not. Right. Yes. No, this is no, this is there are no shortcuts to this collection. We own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man right. by hook or by crook. <laughs> yeah. Just talk to our wives about it. They'll, they'll tell you right. that they're very intimate with what that meant um, and typically some cashola. But anyway, I just I just thought, you know, since we breeze past that, some people might be new and not really know what that means. because We don't talk about our collection all that much anymore. But this is all to say, thank you everybody for joining us for this bonus 6.1 episode of season five of The Amazing Spider Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider Man comic universe. Is this a point one episode, Mark, or is it a point CD episode <laughs> for, for this one? <laughs> I, I guess it depends on, on who the editor is at the time. Right. I mean, I, I, I'll i stick with the point one format. I like to keep it simple because, you know, I don't know how to collate the, the point HUs or whatever's. Um, but um, for, for, for those who want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present and future, you can subscribe to Amazing Spider Talk on your favorite podcast app every other week. We put out a mainline episode of our flagship show, or point one, I guess you can say, <laughs> and sprinkled in between, we review a new comic as well as interview some of the greatest Spider-Man creators of yesterday and today. Uh, so this is the perfect time to start listening. Yeah, no, strange episode to get started with, but if it is your first, you know, like comics, every uh, every comic is somebody's first. Not sure how much modern <laughs> comics uphold to that rule, but we do. Uh, so every podcast <laughs> is someone's first. Anyway, uh, in this season of the all-new Amazing Spider Talk, we're going back to the mid-80s when comics were changing, embracing new visual styles, aging up with their audiences, and ditching formulas that had defined serialized superhero comics for a decade. In this case, Tyrone Johnson and Tandy Bowen are Cloak and Dagger, a crime-fighting team and light and darkness incarnate. These partners once lived on the outskirts as runaway teens, they embraced vigilantism after their powers activated through experimental drugs. Their relationship is symbiotic. Cloak's ability to summon and enter the dark force dimension is counteracted by psionic light that Dagger emits. Uh, but they also played a key role in 1980s spectacular Spider-Man comics and became longtime supporting characters in Spider-Man comics and events. Uh, what makes them such an important recurring role in Spider-Man's life? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the stories that uh, we'll be featuring prominently will be Spectacular Spider-Man issues number 64, 69, 70, 81, and 82, as well as the Cloak and Dagger miniseries, uh, volume one, number one through four. Uh, we'll be briefly touching on Cloak and Dagger's developments past these issues, but not in great detail. So we're really focusing you know, within the era of comics that we've been talking about all season long here. Right. And, you know, who are the who is this duo and why are they linked to Spider-Man? Hopefully we can kind of demystify that for you guys in, in, in some way. Before we get to the main bulk of the episode, I wanted to quickly say that, um, you know, Mark, I learned my lesson from our annual episodes. Uh, at least I learned one lesson <laughs> from the annual episodes, and that is don't provide your address publicly 
to like thousands of listeners who, who might want to send you crazy things. Now it turns out the person behind right. the annual story was a friend of mine that I just volunteered my address to. But I, I think right. I co- Although there was a copycat, <laughs> there we, was we a copycat. There was a copycat, right? Thank you for yeah. reminding me. My wife will not let me forget it. So, Mark, yeah. I actually think this ends up being a positive for the show. Is that you know what? I went out and I got our show a PO box. So we now have a mailable address that you can reach us at, and we put that address in the show notes for this show. So if any of you out there listening are so inclined and you ever wanted to mail us something, whether it be creepy letters with cut out magazine letter or letters in it, I mean, go for it. You know, um, if we get something interesting, you know, Mark and I will talk about it on the show. Um, I just felt like this was a safer, uh, you know, way to kind of get stuff in that wasn't coming to my house and really allow us to advertise a mailing address. So, you know, um, if you if email is too conventional for you, or you're like our former president and you don't write emails, you know, feel free to send Mark and I a letter or something. I mean, it could be anything. So if you really <laughs> are can, so, they can send you letters. Yeah, you don't have to send me letters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then, m- mark it to me, and and I'll say that they, it is in California and Mark is in New York. So if you do send it, chances are it will get to me first before Mark. So if you do have something you want to get to Mark. And it's like food related or whatever. It's probably not going to not going to make it, Um, in which case maybe you should just email Mark. That Montreal bagel recipe we've been talking about. Right. I mean, (laughs) I want me some sweet bagels or or the director's cut of Karate Kid 3. That's what we're talking about. Right. There you go. There you go. So anyway, if you want to contact us, we the P.O. box will be in the uh, the show notes and you're welcome to utilize it for whatever you deem appropriate, in which case then I'll freak out. But um, yes, uh, we have a PO box now and it seems like a big deal, but it's probably not. Anyway, worth mentioning. Why don't we get to the show, yeah, right, Mark? I was gonna say, I mean, you, they might as well be sending things to the dark uh, the dark force dimension. And on that note, let's talk about Cloak and Dagger. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair transition. All right, Cloak and Dagger. <laughs> Uh, Mark, tell us a little bit about these two characters, Cloak and Dagger. Absolutely. Well, they were created uh, by uh, Bill Matlow and Ed Hannigan uh, after first appearing in Peter Parker, The Spectacular Spider-Man, number 64. Uh, Cloak and Dagger are, of course, Ty Johnson and Tandy Bowen. Uh, They were uh, two teenage runaways who uh, were basically... Uh, kidnapped and fed synthetic drugs that were meant to be like more addicting than heroin. Um, we could talk about just how awful of a concept that is, and that not not the I'm just not I shouldn't say it's not a bad concept, but just how awful of a of a origin story that is right. uh, in in a few. Um, and you know, rather than killing them like it did to all the other teenagers who received these drugs, it gave them these uh, special powers. You know, cloak. Um, he, as you mentioned, he uh, absorbs his adversaries into his big uh, cloak, uh, into the, uh, is it the dark mist dimension or the dark force dimension? The dark I mean, force it's a, it's dimension. A dark force dimension. It's a very dark uh, and horrific place that he brings any, like, you know, there are some stories where he, like, absorbs these people and, like, keeps them there for days, apparently. <laughs> so, um, you know, not a, not a fun place to be lost. How it works um, is kind of nebulous. Like, some people get lost yes. in there forever, and other people are able to, like, punch their way out. Um, but, uh, yes. and some people aren't affected by it. Like, uh, he, he would eventually become kind of like an Avengers assist character, and they would all travel via cloak. Right. Um, Tandy, meanwhile, uh, as Dagger, she and, you know, I'm glad that you said the word first because I constantly struggle with it. She uses psionic light daggers, uh, which, you know, what they kind of establish early on is when they strike an opponent, it like turns their blood into ice. Um, So, I mean, you know, pretty, pretty vicious, brutal powers here. Um, You know, not 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 for the faint of heart. it's it's worth noting uh, that Bill Mantlow, um, you know, prior to uh, his accident that that has like left him um, incapacitated for the last almost 30 years now, I think. 
Um, he uh, he left comics in the mid '80s and actually. Um, so like, the stories of Cloak and Dagger kind of tie into um, his his desires to create these like more socially conscious heroes. I mean, you know, Mantlo also created Rocket Raccoon, so I don't know how socially conscious Rocket is. <laughs> uh, but, but Cloak and Dagger certainly like he wanted like he he created these characters. Um, to kind of play up the social justice angle that he wanted to to establish in comics, and um, his uh, co-creator, the, the co-creator on them, Ed Hannigan, kind of said, you know, from the onset that when when Mantlo dreamed these guys up, he's like, you know, he he intended for them to kind of take off on their own, like he was going to use Spider-Man to introduce them because, you know, it's a great place to introduce new characters. It's one of the one of the most read books in 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 Marvel, um, but you know. Cloak and Dagger were kind of meant to be their own thing uh, after a while, although they never truly took off as their own thing, which we can talk about in a little bit. What do you think? I mean, like, I always thought that their power set was really cool, and I think that's what's kind of given them some lasting power, but I always thought it was funny that their name was Cloak and Dagger because Cloak and Dagger to me suggests, like, spies or some kind of, like, clandestine, secretive, sneaky thing and I guess they kind of hang to the shadows and stuff and it's a it's great names for this this pair it's very memorable but I, I do find it funny that they're not actually like you know, like stealthy or you know sleuthy or spy like characters given given their names yeah I mean you're right in that they they you know they they kind of operate in the shadows a la like Daredevil or Batman or Moon Knight whatever but like you know when they appear there they, they, there is nothing stealthy about them they kind of, you know their, their 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 whole approach to like vigilante justice is very uh blunt to say the least um but no i mean these are these are very cool well conceived characters um you know and we could talk a little bit about you know how they work in the scheme of spider-man and maybe offer some analysis about why they haven't really worked on their own i mean i think you know, it almost seems like it's more of a matter of circumstance why they haven't worked on their own, but we, we can get into that. And there's also kind of like a, a romantic element between the two of them that I think becomes more pronounced as time goes on. And adaptations of them certainly, you know, have leaned into that a little bit harder, like the ultimate version of, of them. Um, but it is interesting to right. know, you know, like they're like a biracial couple, you know, in the pages of these comics, which, you know, I can't think of one. Um, you know, a, a, of similar uh, note in, in Marvel Comics at the time of their introduction? No, certainly not then. And, and you know, to, again, to Mantlo's credit, like, not really, they didn't really bring that out as much. I mean, they just kind of did it, you know? Like, there there wasn't, like, you know, when they paired off Tandy and, and, and Ty, I, I don't feel like they made a point of being like, I'm black and you're white, you know? It was pretty... Right pretty just you know they just they just got along and became friends and then had this horrible experiment happen to them and got powers right absolutely so let's talk about them as like companions or foils to spider-man i mean when they when they first show up you know i think like most of spider-man's companions they're kind of there as anti-heroes or perhaps even outright villains you know i think they start off like you know pretty much like the punisher you know they're they're very unforgiving and, uh, you know, it makes me wonder how much of this might have been, you know, related to playing up themes from Ditko. You know, they have a very black and white uh, view of the world. You know, if you if you sell drugs or do drugs, then like we're going to kill you. And uh, it makes me think of like, you know, like Mr. Mr. A or the question and even like Rorschach, who would debut a few years after their debut, especially with the color scheme, the black and the white. Uh, you know, their worldview, it kind of operates very similarly. And that is an interesting challenge for Spider-Man. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely feels like Spider-Man is always seems to be the hero that gets paired off with these characters, you know, it's, <laughs> a, it's which is interesting because like Spider-Man, you know, what I like, frankly, what I like when Spider-Man is with the Punisher or with Cloak and Dagger. I mean, these, these kind of anti-hero characters is, you know, and we've talked about this a lot over the years, you know, and we even talked about it, I think last episode, Spider-Man, despite what we, how we sometimes kind of 
put on a pedestal. He's not pure, you know, like Spider-Man operates with outside the, the, the realm of the, of the law himself. But, you know, he, he has this, you know, his whole origin story is based in this, this code of, you know, using great power responsibly. So like he has a certain morality to him where there are lines that he doesn't cross, but like, it's an arbitrary line. There's not, there's nothing, there's nothing stopping Spider-Man from crossing the line. And, you know, like him saying, well, you know, passing value judgment on these other characters, it kind of rings hollow because, you know, he's perceived as a menace and he's not, it's not like he's, he's law enforcement himself, you know, it's just, he's, he's a vigilante as well. So it's kind of like, you know, I feel like when you put these characters next to each other, it kind of exposes Spider-Man's false morality in a way. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I don't think Spider-Man's willing to cross the line that they do into murder, but, um, I mean, from from public perception, like for them to see Spider-Man judging them, I think maybe runs, rings a little false, like you're suggesting. Yeah, I think that's more what it, that's that's more or less what it is. It's not it's not you know no Sp- Spider Man is not crossing the line, but it's like, you know, when he's trying to stop them or when he tries to stop Frank Castle, it's not like, you know, I I almost feel like these characters don't have to take him seriously because it's like, well, what are you gonna do about it? You know, what I mean? <laughs> like, you know like you know. Like you're, 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 you're just going to sit and wax, you know, poetically about your morality here. But like, you're, it's not like you're operating within the realms of the law yourself. You know, like everyone, everyone here is operating outside of the law. It's just some are doing it to greater extremes than others. That's what it boils down to. And it's like, you know, it kind of puts Spider-Man more into these shades of gray versus someone like the Punisher or Cloak and Dagger who are both, you know, outfitted in black and white, <laughs> you know, right. which is kind of interesting when you think about it. <laughs> well, what, you know, in terms of that design, like one of the things that really stands out to me about cloak and dagger in their debut is artist Ed Hannigan's pencils. And, you know, he's aided by Al Milgram on, on inks, but, um, Ed Hannigan, you know, his New York, I think stands out as completely different than any other artist that had worked on Spider-Man thus far. And I mean, I think you can even see it on the covers of these issues where like they're slightly canted. It looks like the comic is falling aside and these characters are bursting out of it. But they're, they're, his New York is really the New York of the 1980s or like the New York of Taxi Driver. You know, it is gritty and grimy and everybody is sweating all the time. Like it's just, you know, there, there's drug dealers in the alleys waiting for you. You know, um, I mean, I, I didn't live in New York in, in the 80s, but, you know, in terms of like popular conception of how New York was presented in the 80s, like this really dives into the seedier element that we don't, you know, normally see in a Spider-Man comic. And I think it allows for characters like Cloak and Dagger to really fit in or really be born of the New York. And, you know, in terms of like Ed Hannigan's New York, I think he would make Ross Andrew blush. Like he does the same thing, just kind of really referencing the city, but in a very different light. Whereas Ross Andrews, New York is one you'd want to visit. Ed Hannigan's New York right. is one you want to take a bus out of town. Uh, you know, and in the case right. of, of, um, you know, Tandy and Tyrone, uh, it's like the minute they take the bus into town, <laughs> their lives get <laughs> changed forever. So, yeah. uh, yeah. it just feels yeah. like a place you're waiting to get preyed on. So how, how much, uh, you know, of, of kind of like eighties, New York, do you see like, you know, as someone who lived, you know, I guess like your youth in New York in, in the eighties, do you find this representation in some ways, uh, nostalgic or whatever the term would be? <laughs> I don't know if it's just, nostal- I mean, like, I, I mean, I mean, first of all, in terms of like the, the contemporaries of the time, I mean, like I would say like, you know, the only other. I shouldn't say the only other, but the other big comic where you were seeing this kind of New York, in my opinion, was, you know, obviously the, the Frank Miller, Klaus Jansen, uh, daredevil. I think they, they nailed that tone down, um, pretty excellently. Um, you certainly didn't see this in JRJR, uh, his Spider-Man. You didn't see it when friends took over, um, a few years later, Uh, you know, like this was, you know, I mean, there were other artists, I think that were trying to get, 
in on the gritty New York street level thing, but like, you know, Miller and Johnson and uh, Jansen and then, yeah, Hannigan and Spectacular was just was just nailing it. I mean, you know, like to me, I mean, keep in mind, I mean, at this time I was barely, barely born. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, I remember going into the the city like as a five or six year old, like uh, with my parents. And yeah, I mean, there was definitely a period like, you know, you, we went to see a Broadway show, but like you didn't, you didn't, you didn't leave Broadway. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Like if you, if you, if you walked one or two avenues over, like you were kind of like, where the hell am I? You know? And like, and, and it, it was kind of spooky. I mean, I'll um, tell you a definitive but... story from, from my childhood. The first time I went to New York, we took a, a bus into the city from, from Maryland. And it was me and all these like white suburban mothers with their right. kids and families. And it was snowing outside, really idyllic, right? We were going to see a Broadway show and explore the city for the first time. My parents had really like sold it to me, but also told me like, stay close to us. We step off the bus, I think somewhere like 38th street and Broadway. And right. a guy comes around the corner covered in his own blood, just screaming. <laughs> and this was my first right. introduction ever to New York city and my parents being doctors, like went to deal with that. Uh, and like, maybe try right. to get this guy some help. And somehow I went to college in New York after that, <laughs> after that first impression. But you know, that was like 92 or something like that. And I'll never, I'll never forget it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it you know, I, I still remember the first few times I like, you know, when I got, when I was in high school visiting colleges and stuff, I would take the bus my, myself out of port authority and like, you know, it, it was like, you know, I felt like my, my, my parents were shipping me off to like, you know, my funeral or something. It's like, you know, like, like call us every five minutes. It's like, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it it, 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 I mean, all the same is this very hyper stylized to a point because yeah. like, I mean, and we, we, I don't know if you want to talk about it now or a little later. I mean, like, I mean, this origin story, while I think a good one, this, you know, like this is horrifying, you know what yeah. I mean? Like this is, this is, this is one of the more horrifying origin stories out there. I mean, this isn't like, oh, he got hit with a gamma bomb and became the Hulk. I mean, like, you know, these, these, these were teenagers that were kidnapped and then murdered in cold blood by gangsters who were just looking to make cheap drugs. I mean, like, that's like. You know, like, I don't think that's necessarily I'm not trying to be naive, but like, you know, like this isn't necessarily ripped from the headlines. I mean, this is like hyper inflated and stylized <laughs> from like, you know, and like even like when you get to like the cloak and dagger mini, um, you know, one of the characters they're chasing after is someone who's like going into drugstores and like replacing children's aspirin with cyanide. And you're like, that's so effed up. Yeah, <laughs> like this is like really dark dark stuff i mean as bad as new york was i don't get the sense that that was happening with regularity and this makes it sound like yeah you know we just you know the the, the mob just killed like what like 40 kids or something i mean that's insane well certainly not on ellis island either but uh you no. know how did they get the boat out there i i, <laughs> I want right, to know right. but um yeah. Um, so, I mean, like w one of the interesting things we're talking about them murdering, but like the theme that they keep hitting on in these shows is like who appointed you judge, jury and executioner, you know? And, and that to me is like a, re it's a real reoccurring theme in Spidey comics. And at this point, I think it was still pretty novel. Um, you know, and, and I think that's what locks them in as like reoccurring characters in Spidey comics, because they did at the time have a real novel thing going you know, we talked you know, about, you know, the the overcoming impossible odds. You know, I, I think stories like this, you know, really set a template for uh, like Spider-Man new, meeting new characters. I mean, it, you can even think about in the ultimate universe. There's that Geldof villain that's introduced that's just blowing up cars with his mind. Um, and the whole lesson is Spider-Man trying to reform that person and teach them this valuable lesson about power and responsibility I don't know that he gets through to cloak and dagger in the same way, but you can see the formation of that kind of story trope really like landing here 
It's just in a really dark setting. And especially from Bill Mantlo, who I feel like leaned into fantastical and here he leans the hard, the opposite direction. Yeah. I mean, like he, he truly had a love affair with these characters. I would think like, 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 like I, I, you know, every interview I've read about his creation of these characters. I mean, like clearly he wanted these two to represent something much bigger than, than the usual comic book creations. Because yeah, when you look at his other creations or just his other storylines, you know, he, it, you know, he, he played with the absurd more than anything else. Right. I mean, you know, not, not to go, not to go back to rocket, but if you ever read the, the initial rocket mini, I mean, that thing is insane. And like, not like in a, like a, a, a gritty realistic way. It's just like, like, you know, makes me say like, what kind of drugs were you on bill? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just kind of just a big trip. And I mean, there's, there's some trippiness to this, but more again, within like the darkness of it and the grittiness of it, like it's, 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 it's so grimy that you're almost like, I mean, like, I, I guess that's where kind of the, the, the surrealism comes in. It's like, like nothing this dark can be real, can it? But like, it seems to be grounded in some semblance of reality. And, and yet I think it's like amongst my favorite Bill Mantlo comics, like the ones with cloak and dagger in them. Like, I think they're really interesting and he's playing with like story structure in a way that he rarely did. You know, I think he tend to be all over the place and these, he feels very honed in on who these characters are almost immediately. Um, they, they feel important and valuable to this world, uh, straight away. Um, so, you know, yeah. one of the other major things that kind of happens in this storyline involves the character of Silvermane, whose return I could never explain. He was shrunk <laughs> into a one cell organism and then randomly reappeared, um, I think in the pages of Spectacular in... or was it like later Amazing? Um, Actually, no, I think he showed up. See, I like I started like re rereading some of this stuff the other day when I was like, Wait, how did Silverman come back? And he just shows up and he's like 40 randomly. Yeah, yeah. He was in Daredevil, I think, for a little oh, bit. Yeah. And then he, he was apparent. I, and I, I, I didn't, I, I don't remember this, but like I, I read a summary somewhere. It, it, apparently he was in the Bart Hamilton Green Goblin, third Green Goblin story. Yeah. Um, he showed up in the Amazing there. But like, yeah, I mean, this was, I kind of feel like his first extended spider-man arc again since it's the stone tablet fiasco <laughs> and uh so like this this story is kind of famous for making that transition of of silvermane from old dude to old dude slash cyborg um which yeah i mean it's really insane i mean and, and i keep saying that word and i'm cheapening it but like you know i mean first of all i also want to i just want to put out there like to me like silvermane is like you know, the, 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 the character they use when it's like, ah, we're tired of using the Kingpin. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, I'm trying to think of like a, 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 a good, uh, a good like actor analogy. It's like, we can't get the A lister. So here's the C lister that kind of does the same thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. Um, Although I, the Kingpin I, I, is, in, is involved a, a little bit in this story. He's basically kind of getting Spider-Man to do his bidding. He is, although, like, I also feel like Kingpin is more subtle than to, like, you know, again, murder, like, a few dozen teenagers at Ellis sure. Island, you know? Like, again, it just kind of shows, like, you know, the, the, the nuance of the character. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, Wilson, Wilson Fisk is, is incredibly evil, but <laughs> he has limits <laughs> or he just does it more quietly. <laughs> there's nothing more nuanced than like a 12 foot tall robotic old dude, um, in, in right, your comics. Right. But, um, yeah, so Silvermane becomes a robot or cyborg in this and, you know, it, keeping on tone for these books, it's in a really gruesome way. He's like hooked up to all these tubes while he's laying in yeah. bed and like, the bed like collapses on him or like, I think it's the cloak cut or dagger cuts all the tubes and there's just liquids just spill all over yeah. the floor. But thankfully the bed is like hooked up to some life sustaining unit and they, it immediately turns into this like coffin like that keeps him alive and transforms him into a, a robot. Um, and yeah. 
you know, that might like sound really do. silly and stupid, but it ends up turning into one of the best fight scenes, like in Spider-Man comics. Do you want to talk about yeah, that, Mark? I, I do, I do. Although I do want to just throw out there that did 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 Silvermane's I don't want to say death because he didn't die, obviously, but did that scene with him in the bed like did that bring you flashbacks to your first visit of New York or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Right, exactly. <laughs> just all the blood and fluids everywhere. Yeah. Um. No. So I mean, there. So Silvermane is like you know, in his cyborg getup going after Cloak and Dagger, and um, you know it's truly ridiculous but at the same time it leads to this really great um subway fight between spider-man and silvermane and then you know like they're they're fighting in and around a moving subway train and i i, I gotta be honest i'm like i'm i'm rereading this over the weekend and it brought back flashbacks to spider-man 2 the sam raimi movie with the spider-man doc ock fight and i, I it kind of made me wonder um if that was any source of inspiration did you did you get those vibes at all from that scene I mean, only because I saw your note about it. But yeah, I mean, anytime he's fighting <laughs> on the subway, I, I, it, gives, it gives me flashbacks to that. I mean, I can't draw any other more direct connections than that. But, you know, of, of course, right, like the subway fight scene, you know, is, is a great place. And I think even underutilized, to be honest, um, you know, for, for all the fun that subways could provide. But uh, yeah, I thought this was a really fun uh, fight scene, and and the images certainly are are very evocative. So, definitely, um, I did want to mention, so, you know, Spectacular Spider-Man eighty one and eighty two, which are kind of the closer um, for uh, you know these stories. Although it doesn't have Ed Hannigan on art, and I think it really loses a lot uh, for that. Like it just loses some of its bite. And that's true for Cloak and Dagger as well. They both kind of, um, they're not quite as murderous in these stories. And you can see them kind of starting to shift, uh, you know, back towards like kind of who they are today in uh, yeah. Marvel Comics, which is like to say not murderous at all. Um, although they do, you know, re, you know, enact violence on, on people in these issues. Um, you know, in them, Kingpin basically does his classic trick of being like, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So he yeah. uses like, Spider-Man to kind of throw him in the middle of like a Punisher uh, cloak and dagger thing against his enemies. And he basically manipulates them to take down uh, like other mob bosses in the city. Um, and I think cloak and dagger kind of have a realization upon meeting Punisher that like he's the extreme that they don't want to be. And that kind of allows them to fit somewhere in between Spider-Man and the Punisher. They're still more brutal and violent, but not quite to the extremes of Frank Castle. Um, they're, they're okay comics, but I think, like I said, they're lacking Ed Hannigan's art to really make them have that real bite uh, that I think makes those first few issues so special. Um, if really unusual Spider-Man comics. So Yeah, uh, yeah. And, we, yeah. Can we, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about why Ed Hannigan stopped uh, working on these when we start talking about the Cloak and Dagger mini. But first, do we want to talk a little bit about the Slack? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Mark. Sure. So hundreds of listeners like you hang out in our community of Spider-Man fans on Slack. The amazing Spider Slack community is absolutely free to join, and you can jump into active conversations with awesome people about collecting, conventions, movies, new comics, old comics, and more. Yeah, I'm there all the time. Uh, you know, just this week, we've been discussing the free comic book day issue that teased Spider-Man Beyond. So if you're excited to talk about Spider-Man Beyond and what's coming up in that series, you know, head on into our Slack. We're all like theorizing about it and and picking it apart as much as we can. So again, if you want to join this awesome Spider-Man community, just follow the link in the description and be sure to say hi. And once you're there, be sure to let us know what you thought of this new episode, Cloak and Dagger. You know, we want to know what you guys are interested in hearing about. It helps us uh, put our episodes together and we're glad that you guys uh, are a part of this community. All right. So enough about that, Mark, let's get back to talking about cloak and dagger. Yeah. So the, the, they had their very first mini series in 1983. It was about a year and a half after their first appearance. And it's worth noting here, uh, not Ed Hannigan, but Rick Leonardi on pencils, who I will say, I, I, I love the art in this, in this book. I don't know your thoughts on it, but I mean, I think Leonardi nailed the tone 
perfectly that Hannigan had established on the spectacular issues. But I think it's uh, great. Hannigan actually, yeah, I mean, it's just, the book just looks fantastic. Um, but you know, Hannigan basically has like said in interviews that he just burned out on Cloak and Dagger, mm. and I think was kind of burning out on comics in general. Um, and and he had started working on like a couple of breakdowns for the mini and then just kind of, and even like had pitched some elements of the origin story. Cause they, they were going to use this mini to kind of get more into how cloak and dagger met and stuff like that. And apparently Ed Hannigan has said that he was the one that pitched the idea of cloak of, of, uh, Tandy being, um, a dancer, a ballet dancer. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, he, he obviously didn't get to work on it. Uh, Leonardi did, and um, I think what's also very interesting about this mini, and, and kind of surprising given, you know, kind of how Marvel marketing works, but Spider-Man is completely vacant from these stories. Like, this is this is truly meant as a showcase for these two characters. They were not trying any, like, cheap tricks to kind of bring them in. And I don't know if story, I mean, we love the art, but I don't know story-wise if it works as well <laughs> as Spider-Man. What do you think? I mean, I think it probably would have sold a few more books if Spidey poked yeah. his head into it. Um, I mean, I, I think this is a brilliant miniseries. I mean, it's it's a lot of rehash, you know. Um, I, I also wonder if maybe they, like, put it as an ongoing. Maybe it would have, you know, given it a little more, you know, room to breathe and, and, and have people pick it up and maybe throw in a couple cameos. Um, but as a four, you know, issue thing, if you want to know who Cloak and Dagger are, like, I can't think of a better, you know, thing. I, I had not read it until this week. And, you know, it turns out that Marvel Unlimited, despite missing a ton of key Spider-Man comics, has just about every appearance of Cloak and Dagger on the face of the earth, uh, including <laughs> all their miniseries. So this was a really fun discovery uh, for me. And like you said, Rick Leonardi's art is stunning in this. I, I feel bad I didn't ask him about it. Only because of my own ignorance, I, I didn't ask him about it um, on, on the interview that we did. But um, yeah, I totally forgot that he had jumped on this, um, or else I would have maybe have given you a heads up on that when you when you were talking to him. But alas, you know. But I mean, it's it's really. I mean, yeah, it's a beautiful book. See, I, I I'm I'm not quite as fond of it from a story perspective. I kind yeah. of feel, you know, the re like you said, it's a lot of rehash. I mean, it's. Let me rephrase this. It is a great like establishment of these characters. Like if you right. had not read spectacular and wanted to know everything you needed to know about these characters, this mini series is great. But like, I think coming on the heels of reading the spectacular issues and then also just kind of like, like not a lot happens in it. <laughs> like, like there's this, this, this kind of, um, you know, crime of the week thing going on with this, you know, I mentioned this earlier, this guy, he's, going into pharmacies and replacing pill bottles with um, bottles laced with cyanide. Uh, and it's like a it's like a disgruntled pharmacist who's been fired a bunch of times. But they kind of even said in the beginning, he's 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 going to he's going to kill people because he just feels like it, you know, like and, and again, like it's this very stylized and horrendous version of New York where, you know, literally no one is safe. Like you can't even get aspirin and be safe. Uh, which is just kind of terrifying to think about. Uh, but that's, you know, it, it, comics, it, do, it did the job there. Um, you know, you do get um, a lot more of the origin story and you kind of like understand better the codependency between these two characters, which is something we haven't really talked about a lot yet so far this episode. So do you want to talk a little bit about that here? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, just to respond to your thing about the story. I, I agree with you. I think it's like kind of a small story and like by the fourth issue, the story basically halts for them to tell their origin, which is a really fascinating and dramatically rich origin. I just wonder maybe if it was paced out a little bit differently, like over the four issues, maybe you could tell the more complete story. Um, but you're right. One of the key things here is that like cloak is kind of dying of like, he needs to feed, but he doesn't want to go out and start, killing people around New York right. and feeding on innocent people. Um, and so like uh, dagger is feeding him her own light and they have this, like a, you said, a symbiotic relationship where, you know, da you know, they can't get too far away from each other, um, you know, because one fuels the other. 
Um, and there's a point where like dagger is about to die, um, because she's given too much of her light to cloak. It's not really spelled out very well. Like, I don't really understand why he would need to go hurt other people if he has dagger there or like if she fed him slowly, her light, it's, it's a, it's a weird setup, but it's cool that these two are, you know, literally yin and yang to each other. Um, you know, in terms of their power set and, you know, I think a lot of other writers would go on to play with that dynamic uh, o- over the years. Yeah. Um, and like every great Marvel street level story from the 80s, there's a priest. Because <laughs> right. we always got to have the religious angle in, in Marvel street level stories. I mean, at least in every Daredevil story, right? And like a gritty detective <laughs> who's kind of fall. I mean, it, it is. It's you, you joke, but there's a lot of elements of like, de- uh, you know, death of uh, Captain DeWolf in this. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, but, no uh, doubt. Yeah. Um, I did. I also like that they established that tie. He had a stutter, um, and like you know, I, I, I like again. It's it's a very rich origin, you know. They they you know these are they're runaways, but like neither one of them, even with their different backgrounds, like you know, Tandy kind of comes from a more um, successful background, and you know, w- you know, see, you know, her family seems to have some financial security and, you know, but she, she runs away to, to, to be a dancer. Uh, whereas Ty, it's like, you know, he runs away because he just wasn't going to make it in this world. But, you know, it, it's more because of the stutter. He wasn't going to make it. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's not that, you know, he's not dumb. He's not, you know, I mean, he's in, he's, you know, poor, but like it gives you, you, you get the sense from reading this, that, you know, this, this, this disability that he had is what is kind of, you know, in his mind, holding him back and why he needed to get out where, you know, and which maybe wasn't the case, but, you know, but that's just what he felt. So kind of, uh, you know, nice, nice layers to the characterization here, which I thought were really well done. It is interesting, though, like his transformation, he goes from being very sympathetic to kind of like not particularly sympathetic as Cloak. You know, he's, you know, much more prone to going into the darkness and which makes sense given his power set. Um, but he also like his stutter seems to disappear and, um, it's not really commented on, which, which is strange. It's just a part of the character that would just evaporate, um, you know, with his transformation. Uh, it's like Peter's glasses, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Bye. See you later. Um, don't need those anymore. Um, you know, the, the, the series did eventually get spin off, spun off into an ongoing, it was a bi-monthly ongoing. I mean, that's, that's something. Um, and it only lasted 11 issues and then it was eventually absorbed into like, a uh, strange tales with Dr. It was, you know, a two, uh, two stories in one strange tales with Dr. Strange. So, I, I mean, again, like this is a good breakdown of these characters, but like, Without, without, I don't know. Like, I mean, the, the, you you kind of get the sense from these why it didn't work as an ongoing. I I really don't know. I mean, I think maybe like the appetite for something this dark with a character people are aren't familiar with may, maybe was like ahead of its time, you know, in, in some ways. Um, and I also think like not tying into the regular Marvel universe in a bigger way maybe you know kind of left them you know, on their own little boat and could be, you know, readily ignored. I mean, they're yeah. not like as bad as something like brute force, you know, like th- this is really interesting ca- character work um, in, in these books and a, and a great design. Um, you know, maybe it was just and, meant to sell those 12 issues and have them be supporting characters here every, every now and again. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting to me what you had mentioned earlier with those last few issues of spectacular where they see the Punisher and they kind of like, decide to dial it back a little bit. Whereas, you know, again, in this era, not to keep bringing him up, but like, you know, the Punisher, he had his, his Mike Zek, uh, mini, and then he took off on his own solo series and, you know, was one of the most popular things Marvel produced for a solid decade or more. Um, and it, it, it and it makes you wonder, I mean, you know, say what you will about the Punisher and his solo series and stuff like that. But like his character was very, strongly defined in terms of what he was going to do to you if he viewed you as being bad whereas maybe in pulling back and trying to make cloak and dagger more nuanced did it kind of like dull them a bit to the point where they just 
weren't exciting enough on their own. I mean, it's just something to throw out there. And, and maybe the threat was a little more nebulous, right? Like, you know, you have Punisher who's fighting kind of all the organized crime and Cloak right. and Dagger are fighting drug dealers. And, right. you know, I, I wonder if maybe like it was too real, like for, you know, you, sometimes you want to detach into your superhero fantasy and, you know, it, it, you have a lot of real, you know, issues with drug, the war on drugs and, uh, right. the, you know, the, a, the AIDS epidemic, uh, I, how much people want to go into that world in, in their Marvel comics. I, I, I don't know. Um, but looking back on it, I really appreciate, you know, seeing comics that really want to get into something of real substance. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about kind of like the legacy of these characters, because it, it is to me, it is a complicated one. I mean, they, they they've kind of past this mini series and these early appearances in spectacular i feel like they've they've there's been many iterations of cloak and dagger i mean one of the mo more interesting ones frankly was um this whole thing are they you know where they were basically considered like mutants for a period and they were actually i think part of new mutants uh the chris claremont series for for a bit um and then that was kind of changed that they were and if i'm saying this wrong i apologize i'm this is why i don't we're not an x-men podcast they became mutates which are, <laughs> which are mutants who um who have powers that were derived from an external mutagenic source uh any 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 thoughts on the mutant mutate uh controversy with cloak and dagger dan uh no not not particularly for me but i mean there's a number of like x-men who have like some kind of external, um, you know, uh, event that triggers their mutant abilities, like uh, Sunfire, for example. Right. You know. Right. Um, so you know, I, I think they fit into that realm. I had never really thought of them as mutants, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes enough sense. So, like the idea being like like the retcon is they always had these powers within them, but this heroin, you know, uh, knockoff unlocked it um and not just for them too right like there's there's other characters uh one in specific that was born out of their origin story in a really cool way do you want to tell people about that a little bit um i'm sorry i'm blanking there what, what are you talking about i'm talking about <laughs> mr negative uh oh you know, i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> there's a really great like dark rain mr negative story which establishes the the background of uh mr negative which is that Turns out that he was actually one of the other kids that got injected uh, with these these synthetic drugs, and he kind of obviously took on both the light and the dark el elements uh, of it. And um, I remember picking up that Dark Rain Mister Negative issue and thinking, "Oh well, I'm just buying a bunch of you know Spider-Man related comics at the time, mostly because I was really enjoying the run and not expecting to get something like so tied into." the backstory of cloak and dagger and, and revealing Mr. Right. Negative's origin, a, a really cool issue. Yeah. And was this, I'm trying to think in the timeline, was this pre or post the Nick Spencer, uh, cloak and dagger mini for spider Island. I'm, I'm assuming it's before, right? Yeah. Before it was during the dark rain during brand new day. Dark rain. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that was, that's a little bit of a blind spot for me, Dan, but you know, we, we won't, we won't talk about that. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So yeah. Mr. <laughs> Negative's origin is directly tied to cloak and dagger. Um, Got it. Got I would it. love to, I would love to see, um, you know, maybe them fight Mr. Negative at some point, but I don't think it, they've ever really truly been linked in any, any, any books other than, um, you know, that the, the, during volume four of amazing Spider-Man, which you and I covered, they like were evil and working for Mr. Negative. Um, after they had kind of like, uh, during the Nick Spencer storyline with them, their powers had been switched. And right. so like, and there it's revealed that cloak was supposed to be light all along and dagger was supposed to be dark all along. Although I don't think anybody's ever acknowledged that, uh, again. Um, but during volume four, in the worldwide story, Spidey's able to switch them back. Uh, so um, they don't ever fight Mr. Negative, I don't think, in any kind of substantial way. But they do encounter their old friend, I guess, from from that moment. Um, what time. else has they been featured in? 
Well, I mean, yeah. So by the '90s, they 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 did get their own series again, and you know, friend of the pod Terry Kavanaugh uh, worked on that for a bit. He wrote a bunch of issues, and he, you know, I I had spoken to him a while ago when I was putting together stuff for my 100 Things Spider-Man book, and he had, he, you know, he had basically he he loved working on Cloak and Dagger, and he had said that he felt like Marvel just never truly got what they had with the two very underutilized, and you know, at that point, you know, this was twenty. 2017 so the the television show on freeform hadn't come out yet and he was like no they'd be great for tv i mean we, that, that i don't know one season of tv remains to be seen um but you know around the same time that they had their own series they also showed up in of course the 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 mother of all storylines maximum carnage which we have not we really have not <laughs> talked about on this show have we <laughs> maximum carnage i think we alluded not, to not it. In I, detail, I hate maximum but... carnage by the way i i i've talked about that many <laughs> times i think the, i think it's utterly schlocky but that's just me <laughs> Well, it's where I got to meet Cloak and Dagger for the first time. So, like, yeah. I, I appreciate it for that. Uh, I think as a kid, it was one of the first stories I read in the Spider-Man universe. And so I really loved it. And as an adult, I, I agree with you, Mark. I'm not not a big fan of that storyline. But um, Although I did, I did love in the Maximum Carnage SNES game when you, like, got, like, one of the... the the cloak icons, you would just like summon him and he would just like wipe out all the characters on the screen, which was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, that was I, fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, they, 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 you know, in terms of like other um, uh, comics that they showed up in, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, they became key allies of the Runaways, which is, you know, their own little cult universe. And, you know, obviously it makes sense. They, Cloak and Dagger are like the the flagship runaways of Marvel. <laughs> so, of course, they would uh, kind of align themselves with a bunch of teenage kids who have uh, super villain parents that would um, be, run away themselves. So, you know, good, good tie in there, uh, Marvel. Good job. <laughs> yeah. And then they would also sometimes operate with the Avengers. Like I'm thinking like House of M, Cloak plays a, like a major role. Um uh, you know, he, he was kind of become like a de facto teleportation device for like the new Avengers and stuff. Um, you know, and, and at least he was used in like a functional way, uh, d during that. And then, you know, as we alluded to before, they got their own kind of mini series during spider Island, which I thought was pretty excellent for the first few issues. Um, I think Nick Spencer thought it would end up and Marvel probably thought it would end up being, its own series, but it just didn't sell well enough. And I remember yeah. the final issue of that is just like jam packed with story ideas um, that we never really got to see come to fruition because it was basically Nick Spencer being like, here's what I wanted to do in an ongoing. Let me just shove it all into one comic, which couldn't be more yeah. the opposite of what we're experiencing now. But um, <laughs> it does make me wonder why they've not really appeared in Nick Spencer's run on amazing Spider-Man, given his fondness, for them. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, and I seem to remember it might have been the Superior Foes uh, Christmas episode that we did with um, Nick and um, Steve Lieber, where Nick, Nick Spencer basically said, like, you know, he he wanted, you know, he was supposed to that was supposed to be an ongoing like like he was more or less promised. And then because it didn't sell, he didn't get it. So like Superior Foes kind of became the consolation, uh, which I mean, you know, great consolation prize. I mean, you know, to me, it's still <laughs> yeah. one of my favorite, favorite, you know, Spider-Man adjacent things that's been produced over the last 20 years for sure. Um, but and then, you know, like it's worth noting, you know, I alluded to it earlier. I mean, they they were on their own television series. Cloak and Dagger was on Freeform. It, it lasted about was it one season or two seasons? I mean, it, 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 it was about a year. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, you. I mean, I I got to be honest, Dan. I've never watched it. Um, have you watched it? I have not, but I heard decent things about it. I mean, whether it's good or not, I, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna opine. But all the same, like, hey, you know, like how many how many things from the comics? Putting aside what Disney Plus is doing right now, how many things from the comics get their own TV show? I mean, that's worth that's right. to me that's 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 a sign of success in its own right, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, don't let uh, like Sony Pictures get whiff of it. Although I think they were included in that Spider-Man package 
that that they bought, which is I bet Freeform is like related to Sony. I don't know, but um, yeah, I heard good things about it, and then it was much more in line with the Ultimate Universe versions of them, which kind of see them as like uh, I think like they were a couple in high school, and they're in like a car accident together, and that kind of triggers them to getting an experimental new drug or something like that. Um, I remember liking it and they were, you know, friends of Miles Morales for, for a, a long time until they were wiped out along with that universe or so we were led to believe in secret wars, but it was immediately retconned. So who knows? Maybe we'll see the ultimate versions of them, you know, show up, uh, who knows so, sometime, sometime soon. Um, Excellent. Well, great, Mark. This All was right. fun. I mean, like Cloak and Dagger, what, like, where do they sit with you? Are they are they kind of favorites of yours? Do, do you enjoy them as characters? I, ne- I don't know if I would call them favorites, but like they're, it, they're fun. And, and like they, 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 they do bring up a nostalgia. I mean, like like you, I mean, I know I'm a little older than you, but like, you know, Maximum Carnage at the time was – a big deal. So like having them be a part of that kind of like elevates them in my, in my nostalgic mind a bit. And, right. you know, I, I also remember, and you know, I, I, I say this gritting my teeth, but there was, um, a annual of spectacular Spider-Man. It might've been like either the early nineties or late eighties that had, the, and I, I wish I remember who the, the artist was on it, but there was this great cloak and dagger cover. And I remember picking it up, uh, at the time on the spinner rack and being like, wow, like these characters look cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like it's, it's, they're, they're really interesting visually. They have really fun powers. Um, you know, I love the shades of gray, no pun intended with the two of them. Um, you know, like I, 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 and I do feel they've been underutilized because I, I, I maybe that's part of the issue here. It's like, I, I, I don't, necessarily i can't call them favorites because i don't feel they've been used enough in my in my storylines to to be a favorite but like i wish i wish they were used more i think that they're they're you know and and i would love to see that many i would love to see an expenser do that many i know that's not going to happen now but i would love to see it i mean not many that ongoing you know like i the, to me yeah. that's like one of the great what ifs of of creator comics here <laughs> absolutely um well yeah and and for me like i said i think I think they remain a favorite if only because of their proximity to me starting reading comics, you know, I think they're really cool idea and cool characters. And, you know, anytime I, I always buy their mini series and stuff whenever they come out. So, um, you know, I, and, and there's a fondness I have for them. Uh, you know, I, they didn't really show up in like the cartoon series or anything like that growing up. So like they were like pure comics characters to me and, uh, you know, that's what I liked about them. Um, so anyway, yeah, this is fun. So, so cloak and dagger, not sure we're going to say too much more about them in future episodes. Maybe when we finally do talk about maximum carnage, but I'm glad that we took the time to kind of talk about them. Well, Mark, it's getting late. So I, I, I think it's time for us to start heading home. Uh, I am going to, uh, lead us out by talking about our Patreon. If you find this show entertaining and valuable, you know, please consider supporting us. Recommend Amazing Spider Talk to a friend. And if you're able, become a member on Patreon. We can only bring you this content with the support of our Patreon members. And we owe the show's success to every single one of them. And we are constantly making exclusive content for our members. This week, Patreon members will hear Dan and my review of Sinister War number two and the Spider-Man Freak issue yeah why not take three dollars 99 cents the price of a new comic and put it towards a month's subscription to support the show and start receiving our patreon content that way you'll hear our patreon exclusive review podcast of every new issue of amazing spider-man the same week it comes out instead of waiting for it to arrive in our public podcast feed and if you contribute ten dollars a month you gain access to exclusive artwork from famous spider-man artists commissioned exclusively for our members This season, we'll be mailing out a print by artist Ron Friends. He's created a lost page of the kid who collects Spider-Man for us, inked by Brett Breeding, depicting Tim and Spidey sharing laughs over Tim's Spider-Man comic collection. Plus, every episode, we release a new episode-specific desktop background created for us by artist Nick Cagnetti for our patrons to enjoy. 
Yeah, but we know also it's a hard time for everybody, as it is for us too, especially heading into this fall. Be safe, everyone. So uh, we appreciate anyone who just supports the show by listening and sharing, which helps us out a great deal. But if you do have the means, please join our Patreon to support the continued existence of our show. Just follow the link in the description. And thank you again to all the members who already make this show possible. But it's that time, time for all good things to come to an end. So we want to say thank you to you, the listeners and viewers, for tuning in to this episode of The Amazing Spider Talk. Yeah, this episode was edited by Rick Coase with production support from Andy Myers. Our artwork comes handcrafted by artists Ron Friends, Sal Busema, Ray Sumzer, and Nick Cagnetti. Our theme songs were produced by Rylan Bojack and Spider Madge. Plus, our introduction animation and musical singer comes from Josh Sutton from the YouTube show panels to pixels this was a lot of fun dan but tell me and oh i'm gonna be really happy with this right what's coming up next (laughs) yeah mark i think our next episode is the one that everyone has been waiting for since the start of the season yes finally mark and i are going to be talking about our favorite subject and the very favorite subject of i think a lot of our listeners and it is the hobgoblin we're doing part one of our three-part series on the Hobgoblin. Mark, I can't wait to talk about this, except that I can wait to talk about this because our lives are kind of getting a little complicated over the next few weeks. Um, and, you know, me starting school again, you're, you know, doing a bunch of stuff. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but... Um, uh, well, I mean, I, I'm going on vacation, but yeah, I mean, also, you know, stuff at work is ramping up, you know, uh, with the fall coming and everything. So, I mean, I'm not in a school, but for whatever reason, falls picking up for us. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll probably have a little bit of a delay with these just to make sure that they're, you know, well done and well researched and everything we want them to be, but you know, th- they will come and they will be, gr- they will be fantastic. Right, Dan? Yeah. I mean, we, we want these to be like the definitive article on the hobgoblin, you know? So we're going to reach back into old interviews that we've done and hopefully conduct some new interviews. Like we, We really are going to put this all together so that by the time you're done listening to these three episodes, hopefully you are fully versed in all the ins and outs of the Hobgoblin and the drama behind the scenes and all of that craziness that we love about our favorite, you know, botched villain, (laughs) if you you will. Um, So I'm really excited about it. Uh, You know, in, in the meantime, I'm sure we'll have some other special things popping up in the feed here and there. You know, we can never sit too idly. Um, but yeah, if, if, if you're itching for more things, jump on the Patreon, there's going to be a bunch of great stuff there, you know, starting, you know, probably after this, ep- this episode, but yeah, Mark, I can't wait the hobgoblin, man. It, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I, I want to put this to rest cause we've been promising this for a really long time. Absolutely. I can't wait, Dan. Yeah. So I'm um, speaking of, um, kind of extra content. If you're tuning in live, don't forget as soon as the show ends, Our conversation will continue with our audience on YouTube. And if you missed out on Amazing Spider Talk Live this time, you know, don't don't worry. We'll be back soon on YouTube. So go there and subscribe and click on the bell to stay on top of all the new live recordings that we'll be doing in the future. But as always, this will remain a podcast first and foremost. That's going to always be consistent for us, just like how we end the show. And that's with our motto. So, Mark. Until you and I are injected with drugs that unlock our latent mutant podcasting powers that make us inextricably linked together, what's our motto? Wow, that's very specific, Dan. With great podcasts, there must also come the amazing spider talk. Too many who know the angles, uncover and untangle all the questions and the webs left out to tangle. In 1962, last Wednesday's afternoon, they'll bend your ears with reckless self abandon. The amazing spider talk. The amazing spider.